in the decade since Barcelona media began, there has been an explosive growth in the power of technology. Growth in storage, growth in broadband, growth in speed, and explosion of technological power that has caused an explosion of information. Today, there is an estimated 1.8 zettabytes of information. That's 1.8 trillion gigabytes. That's as many bits of information in the digital universe as there are stars in the physical universe. Every two days, we create as much information as we did completely until the year 2003. Every two years, the world's information doubles. One study in the US found that an average person on an average day was bombarded by 34 gigabytes of information. And that's just when they're in the home. How much information is that? Too much. This is Herbert Simon. He won the 1978 Nobel Prize in economics. In 1970, he said this, what information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. Information consumes attention. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention because we don't have infinite attention. We don't multitask. We oscillate. Our days have limited time, and our bodies have limited bandwidth. Here is how, uh, I asked him how he pronounced his name. He says, call me Mike. <laughs> Here is how Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the author of Flow, put the issue of our limited bandwidth. Actually, our nervous system is incapable of processing more than about 110 bits of information per second. And in order to hear me and understand what I'm saying, you need to process about 60 bits per second. That's why you can't hear more than two people. You can't understand more than two people talking to you. So attention is a zero-sum game. And uh, Simon, a wealth of information therefore creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. Information is abundant, but attention is scarce and desirable. We live in an attention economy where we compete with one another for attention. But that competition takes place in two different marketplaces because there are two kinds of attention governed by two systems of the brain. And only one of those systems can even try to allocate attention efficiently. The kind of attention that we attempt to regulate consciously is called top-down attention. It involves the anterior cingulate cortex, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the thalamus. This is sometimes called the brain's executive function. We have some control over it. It's rational. System two is the name given to this part of the brain by Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist who also won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. In his new book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he explains System 2. But there's another kind of attention. Kahneman calls it System 1. It's also known as bottom-up attention. It is at the mercy of the limbic system and the amygdala, which are 
involuntary. This part of the brain pays attention instinctively, emotionally, even irrationally. It pays attention whether we want it to or not. We can't help it. It's in our wiring. So the power of technology causes an abundance of information, creating a scarcity of attention, which is the currency spent by two systems in the brain. Anything causing those systems to spend that currency, anything with the power to occupy our attention is valuable. What has that power? Danger, sex, novelty, play, story, celebrity. There are some others, but we'll stick to those. Danger. If we didn't pay attention to danger, we'd be dead. Once it was a saber-toothed tiger. Today, it might be the fear of crime or the fear of foreigners, or the fear of looking old. Sex. We are programmed to desire. A sexy person or a sexy object automatically makes our heads turn. Novelty. 50,000 years ago, people survived because they noticed what was new. Neophilia. The, the attraction to the new is in our brain. Today in the US, I don't know how it is here, but every other product on the supermarket shelf shouts new, because that's what catches our attention. Play. We played with toys when we lived in caves. We are born to play. Our attention is captivated by sports, by rhythm, by games of chance, by number games and board games. We love visual play, imitation, illusion, magic. We love to play with words, to joke, to make fun of people. The Dutch sociologist, uh, Johan Huizinga, said that we are not homo sapiens, but homo ludens, the animal that plays, and that all of human culture can be derived from the play instinct. Story. If we hear once upon a time, our attention is captured. Scheherazade saved her life by telling stories that never ended. Celebrity. Fame is a magnet. Attention attracts more attention. We look where others are looking. Now, there's a word that means something able to capture our attention. There's the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary. What is it a definition of? Entertainment. That the, the root of entertainment is uh, to near, to hold. And what is held is our attention. And the content that holds it is entertainment. And the power to do that is not trivial. The power to occupy attention is political power. The first person to notice this and write about it 2,500 years ago was Plato. In The Republic, Plato designed an ideal state whose ruling principles were reason and order. The biggest threat to reason and order was poetry. In ancient Greece, the bards who performed the poetry of Homer were we would call them rock stars. They were famous. They competed for big prizes. Tens of thousands of people came. The audiences were driven wild with weeping and cheering. So when Plato says 
poetry, we should think entertainment. Now, the problem with poetry, Plato said, is that it can enchant an audience. It has access to our bodies. It can bypass our reason. No matter how smart we are, even if we think we know better, our minds are no match for its magic. Poets, he said, water and foster the emotions of sex and anger and all the appetites of our souls. Poetry makes our appetites our rulers when they ought to be ruled. If you grant poetry admission to the Republic, he said, pleasure and pain will be lords of your city instead of law and reason. So in Book 10 of the Republic, he banished the poets. The only way to ensure order was to exile the entertainers. The Romans, of course, welcomed entertainment, the circuses part of bread and circuses, as a way to control people. But Plato and the emperors agreed that the power to entertain is political power. So thousands of years later, for modern, sophisticated people like us, are we immune to that power? Entertainment still turns us on. It still possesses us. We lose ourselves in it. We are captivated, spellbound, entranced, enthralled. Enthralled means, literally, enslaved. Plato worried that poetry confuses reality and illusion. Even if we know it's only pretending, it's only entertainment, it makes us believe things that are not true. Surely we have evolved past that, haven't we? Do you know the TV series 24? One of its, in one of its best known storylines, Jack Bauer interrogated terrorists. Torture as a tool. It's used often and effectively in the Fox TV counterterrorism drama 24. Force me cease. That's 24's good guy torturing his own brother. Jack Bauer, the tough, sensitive undercover operative, justifies his actions to save America from Islamic extremists who have just detonated a nuclear bomb in Los Angeles. The United States military is concerned about it because uh, they've started receiving evidence that soldiers in the field have been impacted by it downrange in Iraq, utilizing uh, techniques which they've seen on 24 and then taking them into a environment in the interrogation booth. That's why the dean of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point flew to Hollywood to meet with the writers and producers of 24 to explain that real U.S. soldiers, instead of paying System 2 attention to their teachers and textbooks, instead of learning that torture is wrong and produces false information, instead of that, our smartest young soldiers believed what System 1 told them, believed what this fictional, made-up TV story told them about torture. We may think that Plato's solution, banishing entertainment, is wrong for democracies, but that doesn't refute his case that the power to entertain is political power. Now, the entertainment industry, of course, doesn't think of itself as a curriculum or an agent of political power. It's a business. When we say that entertainment wants us to pay attention to it, it's not just a figure of speech, not just an idiom. We do pay. Our attention is monetized by the entertainment industry. So the power to occupy attention is not only political power, it's also economic power, which I suppose might be thought of as a kind of political power. The business model of entertainment, as you know, has two parts. 
One is distribution. It sells content, objects, and experiences. Sometimes the transaction is a purchase, and sometimes it's a subscription. Often it's the same content over and over at different times on different platforms at different prices with different profit margins. The other part of the business model is advertising. The industry sells the attention of audiences to advertisers. Now, ads are also entertainment. Like the content that they're embedded in, they want to capture our attention with stories, images, and music. They play on our fears. They arouse our appetites. They can bypass the System 2 radar of our reason and go straight for System 1. I'm going to show you one ad. As you watch, try to pay attention to the voice. When you're depressed, where do you want to go? Nowhere. Who do you feel like seeing? No one. Depression hurts in so many ways. Sadness, loss of interest, anxiety. Cymbalta can help. Cymbalta is a prescription medication that treats many symptoms of depression. Tell your doctor right away if your depression worsens, you have unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Cymbalta is not approved for children under 18. People taking MAOIs or thyridazine or with uncontrolled glaucoma should not take Cymbalta. Taking it with NSAID pain relievers, aspirin, or blood thinners may increase bleeding risk. Severe liver problems, some fatal, were reported. Signs include abdominal pain and yellowing of the skin or eyes. Talk with your doctor about your medicines, including those for migraine, or if you have high fever, confusion, and stiff muscles to address a possible life-threatening condition. Tell your doctor about alcohol use, liver disease, and before you reduce or stop taking Cymbalta. Dizziness or fainting may occur upon standing. Side effects include nausea, dry mouth, and constipation. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Depression hurts. Cymbalta can help. Those warnings are required by the government. They're terrifying. Why would anyone want that drug? The answer is that system one in our brain is more powerful than system two. We are spellbound by the story that we see and feel. We are entranced by the music and the images. We may hear the words, but we think the pictures. That's why companies buy audiences to gain direct access to the automatic, instinctive, bottom-up, emotional, irrational attention. In the US television industry, the amount of money that an advertiser pays for 30 seconds of attention has traditionally been based on two metrics. How many eyeballs the ad is exposed to, which is to say ratings, and what kind of people those eyeballs belong to, demographics. <laughs> ratings count the number of people and the time they're exposed to an ad. Demographics segment the audience by age, geography, sex, race, and so on. This data has traditionally been collected by firms like Nielsen, mainly Nielsen, from surveys, panels, diaries, test audiences, and so-called people meters that are on top of their television that Nielsen gives them. The currency of advertising, the cost per thousand viewers, is determined by the demographic desirability of the audience, and the most coveted of all demographic segments is aged 18 to 49. Since the 1980s, based on weak evidence, this segment has been believed to possess the most disposable income and to be the most open to new brands. The 18 to 49 demo is the most expensive to buy and the most profitable to sell. But the explosion of digital technology has disrupted this system in two ways. First, competition. 
more content on more platforms means more competition for attention. That makes audiences smaller, harder to find, and more expensive to count accurately. The second way technology has disrupted the business model is control. Today's audience has more autonomy, more control over what, where, when, and how it consumes entertainment. And because consumers can now also produce and distribute content, the idea of the audience has changed from passive to active. Let's look at each of these in turn. First, competition for audience attention. Seven years ago, there were no iPhones or Androids, no tablets, no e-readers, no Blu-ray, no Xbox, no PlayStation, no Wii, no Roku. Until the 1970s, the video industry didn't exist. By 2010, it had nearly 19 billion in video game and casual gaming revenue, which is $9 billion more than the movie industry. Today, people spend eight hours a week playing video games. Until the 1980s, there were three major television networks in the US. Today, an American with cable or satellite TV has 600 channels to choose from. The internet also captures eyeballs. In 1996, there were 100,000 websites. Today, there are 175 million active sites. In 2003, there were 100,000 blogs. By 2010, there were 200 million. In 2003, there was no Facebook. Today, it has 845 million users. In 2005, there was no Twitter. Today, it has 300 million users posting over 200,000 tweets per minute. Five years ago, Netflix didn't stream movies online. In the last quarter of last year, two billion videos were streamed on Netflix. Five years ago, Hulu Internet TV didn't exist. Today, it has 30 million monthly users. Five years ago, YouTube was in its infancy. Today, it attracts 800 million viewers a month. Machinima, to take one example, a YouTube game channel that didn't even exist eight years ago, now attracts over one billion views per month from 116 million people. So the consequence of all of this competition increasing in the past decade has been the fragmentation of the mass audience into niche audiences, the long tail phenomenon, as it's been named by Chris Anderson. Big audiences for a few hit products at the head of the curve, and small audiences for many more products at the tail of the curve. Technology has not only broken the audience into pieces, it has also given the audience extraordinary new power to control its top-down attention, to control whether, when, and how to consume media. In the US, the penetration of the digital video recorder, the DVR, is on a path to reach half of all households by 2016. And the DVR enables time shifting, watching when you want, not when programmers want. Uh, the DVR also enables ad skipping, fast forwarding instead of watching ads. Cable, satellite, and internet video on demand and streaming have also put consumers in charge of scheduling. Mobile technology, smartphones, iPads, iPods, tablets, laptops, not netbooks, has enabled place shifting, letting people consume content where they want. Peer-to-peer -peer technology has enabled file sharing, both legal and illegal. 
People can get content now not available in the libraries of distributors and not at the price that distributors are charging or on the schedule they have planned. User-generated content. Anyone with a laptop now uh, can create and edit content and tape and remix content and upload and distribute content. Active audiences interact with content by voting, commenting, liking, linking, rating, reviewing, recommending, tweeting, blogging, emailing feedback to writers about storylines, campaigning to influence producers and networks, creating and participating in fan sites. So, technology has created new platforms, new content, new competition, and a new autonomous audience able to contribute to content and control its consumption. And this has disrupted the audience metrics that advertising is based on. When there are more places for people to pay attention, it becomes harder to count them accurately without spending more money to increase sample size. But as Professor Philip Napoli points out in his book, Audience Evolution, the same technology that has increased audience control of content has created a new source of data for content providers about their relationship with content. As people control content, as they interact with it, they create what is called traces or return path data, rich new streams of data about who they are, what they think of the content, and how it affects their behavior. The metrics of return path data provide a new currency for valuing audiences, engagement. There are dozens of definitions of engagement and metrics for it and companies measuring it, but they have a few things in common. They measure potential demand, awareness of content, buzz, chatter, word of mouth, and intention to consume it. They measure appreciation of content, sentiment, emotional response, evaluation, opinion. And they measure behavior, what they did with the content, including the most important behavior, spending money. So what are the sources of this return path data? DVRs and cable and satellite set-top boxes provide a second-by-second -second record of what people view, pause, time shift, rewatch, and fast forward. Data can be collected from DVR menu interfaces, online program guides, and search engines. Data comes from cookies, from apps, from GPS trails, from deep packet inspection, from server logs, from sentiment analysis of Facebook, Twitter, blogs, forums, discussion rooms, and fan sites. From liking, linking, sharing, rating, tagging, inviting, commenting, recommending. From voting, emailing, and texting, and instant messaging to shows. From user production of content, like remixes. From clicking on ads, requesting more information, winning virtual badges, taking part in contests and games. From e-commerce, coupons, social network groupons, and consumer loyalty cards at retail points of purchase. As this return path data about audiences has been harvested, two things have become possible. One is addressable advertising, or behavioral advertising, targeting ads to the individual consumers most likely to be receptive to them and engaged by them. Of course, there's a difference between being engaged by an ad and acting on it, which takes us to the second thing 
that return path data makes possible, which is correlating advertising and sales. This is a man named David Poltrack. He's for uh, 20 plus years, he's been the head of research for the CBS television network. Last spring in New York, at the annual meeting of the Advertising Research Foundation, he announced, based on new research using return path data, that the currency of advertising, demographics-based ratings, was dead. There is no link, none, he said, between the demographics of an ad campaign and the sales generated by that campaign. Reliance on the 18 to 49 demographic is hazardous to all media and marketers. A Nielsen executive at the same event said that ratings demographics by age and sex had a 0.12 correlation with actual sales produced by exposure to ads, where 1.0 is complete correlation and 0 signals no relationship whatsoever. 0.12. You would be better throwing dice than using Nielsen's. Nielsen, of course, is racing to create new products based on new return path data to measure engagement, not just exposure. So are plenty of other firms. Here are some of the companies now mining this data and selling new metrics. ePoll uses an online panel to measure viewer intention, awareness, and attitudes about 600 programs, as well as about celebrities, brands, and music. Rentrack combines data on second-by-second -second exposure to real-time viewing, DVR, video-on-demand, broadband, and mobile. Nielsen's video census correlates Nielsen panel data with server-based streaming metrics, including cached, peer-to-peer, and digital rights management content. Network Insights maps real-time comments on social networks, blogs, and forums onto programming at that moment. Bluefin Labs, a spin-off of the MIT Media Lab, also correlates programming with social media using a huge database of content and screen scraping. Nielsen Online Buzz Metrics performs sentiment analysis on 100 million blogs, user groups, boards, and social network sites. Digital Analytics, a Comscore product, analyzes Twitter, YouTube, mobile browsing, clicks, streaming, and apps. Social TV sites like GetBlue, Miso, TunerFish, and Screen Tribe create online viewing communities whose messages are aggregated and analyzed. OptiMedia, owned by Publicis, sells content power ratings, a proprietary secret sauce, they call it, combining metrics from 17 data streams including Twitalizer, Clout, Buzzmetrics, Facebook, Nielsen Video Census to measure exposure, awareness, loyalty, and advocacy. Now the holy grail in this industry is an ROI, return on investment metric, a single source panel that correlates marketing with purchasing. Two examples of firms chasing that, TRA, the right audience, takes second-by-second -second DVR and set-top data from 3 million TV sets and correlates it with supermarket shopping data from 60 million consumers swiping loyalty cards at cash registers. Nielsen Catalina Solutions is a joint venture between Nielsen and Catalina's 60 million households of frequent shopping data. So, where is all this going? This is the science fiction writer William Gibson, who coined the term cyberspace. In 2003, he said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. I think there are two futures for the attention industry, each in tension with each other, and both already here. One is big data. The other 
is big democracy. We live, says the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago, in the age of big data. The direction we are heading is more return path data, more engaging content, better engagement metrics, better models of the audience, more addressable advertising, more return on investment for advertisers, and more revenue for media. I'll give you some examples. First, more return path data from biometrics. <clears throat> Today, biometrics is used only in research settings. Companies like Affectiva use what they call an Afdex for face and eye movements, and the Q-Sensor 2.0 for skin conductivity. Neurofocus uses a dry, wireless electroencephalogram to measure brain waves of viewers during TV programming and advertising. It's easy to imagine that soon, via cameras and touch screens that are already ubiquitous, that biometric return path data will be universally available. You can imagine people volunteering this data gladly in exchange for coupons or free music and videos. Second example, more engaging content grown on content farms. Content farms scrape the internet to generate keywords that their algorithm predicts will get quantifiable search engine traffic and quantifiable advertising revenue. Based on that projected ROI, they go to freelance contributors and they order up content that uses those keywords in text and videos. Typically, the articles and videos are very short, 200 to 300 words, two to three minutes long, and the creators get as little as 10 to $20. They're posted on sites owned or licensed by the content farms along with advertising geared to the content. The big players now include Demand Media, which works with 7,000 contributors who produce 5,000 articles and videos a day, all based on this algorithm, which gets 61 million unique visits a month. Seed.com, owned by AOL, posts content on more than 80 sites within the AOL network. Yahoo Voices has over 600,000 contributors who get bonuses based on the traffic that their work gets. What are their stories about? Well, articles include, recently, tips for buying a touchscreen monitor, how my backyard is saving me money, if Justin Bieber was a Shakespeare fan. The videos include cooking for dads, stay warm in Alaska, eight steps to powerful blessings. It's easy to imagine what's next. A wider range of genres like comedy acts, mini drama, in animation, with content generated on demand, financed upfront by advertisers, and produced not only by amateurs and freelancers, but also by networks and studios. Another example, analytics as entertainment. This is David Verkin, the CEO of a firm called Canoe Ventures, a company that adds games, contests, and polls to ads to make them more engaging. He noticed that when they reported the results of the polls to the audience, their engagement increased. We are hungry for data about ourselves. As he put it, data is the new creative. We love it when sites tell us what their analytics tell them about us. We want to know what's the most popular, the most emailed, the most commented on. Uh, there's a dating site called OkCupid, okay and it told its users what it had learned from them, that people with iPhones had the most sex on a first date, and people with Androids have the least. The more surveillance we permit, 
the more sticky content we enable. Another example, algorithms as entertainment. There's a, a website called hunch.com. The word hunch, uh, uh, premonitio, intuitio, is the uh, a translation of that. You go to hunch.com to voluntarily give data about yourself. Recently, I did this for the first time. Here are some of the first questions I was asked. Are you named after another family member? How do you feel about cheese? How do you greet someone? Should schools counsel parents when their child is significantly overweight? What does your closet look like? What do you use as an avatar or profile picture? And then you click on a button, and based on your answers and everyone else's answers in their database, they recommend products you might want to buy. Well, my eye was caught by a pair of shoes that I liked. I clicked on it, and then I saw, if you like this, you might also like these. I did like it. So I clicked on another pair and another, and another, and another, and I liked them all. And without realizing it, an hour had gone by. I was completely entertained, and I bought these shoes. <laughs> I believe big data will lead us to understand that the mass audience is not dead. It is networked, dynamic, and global. Mass audiences are big, but temporary. They are constantly forming and reforming. People belong to an unstable set of virtual tribes built around entertainment. We belong to transnational fan communities. Our tastes in entertainment, our engagement with media, are markers of our identity. But so are our other tastes. We are also fans of things, experiences, brands, fantasies, beliefs. We belong to transnational taste communities. Our preferences, what we decide between, in food, in news, in fashion, in cars, in sports, in travel, and every other marker of cultural taste correlates with our taste in TV, music, and movies. And network analysis of big data will reveal these correlations. Taste community analytics will make current analytics seem primitive. They will be dynamic and predictive. They will drive addressable advertising. They will change as you change, moving as you move, through the news cycle and the life cycle. They will know what you like, and they will anticipate what you want. All in all, this is a happy future from media. But while some welcome the age of big data the way they welcome each new product from Apple, what others see, when others see how big data is already being used and may be used in the future, what they see is a nightmare. In the US, this anxiety about big data, a mixture of fear and anger, has spiked upward dramatically just since the start of this year. In January, a book was published called I Know Who You Are and I Saw What You Did. Its title captured the mood. And within days, because of events in the news, this theme, the death of privacy, in the words of its subtitle, were everywhere. First, Google announced that starting March 1st, it would aggregate the data it had about users across 60 Google services, including Gmail, Search, Android, Google+, YouTube, GMAC, and Calendar. There is no opting out. Almost immediately, there was a backlash in Congress which got worse when a Stanford graduate student discovered 
that Google had defeated a privacy feature on Apple's Safari browser, which allowed advertising sites other than Google to put cookies on their iPhones without asking permission. Then, a software designer in Singapore named Aaron Thompy discovered that when he installed an iPhone social media app with two million users called Path, it uploaded his entire address book to its servers without his permission. Within hours, the news was all over the internet. At first, Dave Morin, the founder of Path, denied it. Then he said that uploading your address book without asking was an industry best practice. Then he apologized and said they would delete all the address book data. Then it turned out that PATH wasn't alone. Twitter users were surprised to hear that when they clicked on Find Friends, it meant that they were uploading their address books to Twitter, which was keeping it for 18 months. That became front page news. Then it turned out that a number of other popular Apple apps like Yelp and Gowalla were also sweeping up user data. Again, Congress pushed back. Apple admitted that their app policy requiring user permission to upload contact information was being violated and said they would enforce it better. But then it turned out that app developers could upload all your photos without permission either. Since then, the news media have been in an uproar about identity and privacy and terms of service agreements. Instead of articles about how great it was that exposure to advertising could be correlated to loyalty card data about consumer purchasing and create addressable advertising, instead of that, there was this. Hey, you're having a baby. It's the story of a statistician at a big American retailer who was asked by the marketing department if we wanted to figure out if a customer is pregnant, even if she didn't want us to, can you do that? The answer is yes. And there's nothing to prevent them from selling their list of who's pregnant to anyone. But the debate has gone beyond privacy to the issue of ownership. Who has the right to monetize my data? This was brought into focus by Facebook's initial public offering of stock, raising $10 billion and a valuation of $100 billion. That provoked the question, why does Facebook get to use my story, my friends, my content to make money? The Facebook business model, Facebook is free in exchange for mining your data to sell addressable advertising, was suddenly in question. Users were asking, why don't I own my own click stream? We're giving Facebook personal data worth billions of dollars. Where is our cut? In the US, there are no federal laws spelling out the control and the use of the online data trail of people's personal identity. Here in Europe, as you know, the European Commission is considering a law that would force internet companies to disclose what data they're collecting, what data they're selling, and to give customers the right to opt out, the right to transport their data from one site to another, and the right to be forgotten, to delete their accounts and their data. Now more Americans are asking, why don't we have attention rights? And this has brought new energy to a movement to empower people to own their data and control its, its privacy. A movement to change the focus from big data to my data. You can see this energy in government, in nonprofits, and in the private sector. Two weeks ago, the White House issued what it called an online consumer privacy bill of rights. It's voluntary, but within 24 hours, AOL, Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo signed up. On the same day, the Attorney General of California 
announced that California's Online Privacy Protection Act, the strongest in the country, will now apply to mobile apps, which had no privacy protection before. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Hewlett Packard, and Research in Motion immediately signed on. Many nonprofit groups have been trying to build this movement for a while now, including ID Cubed, Creative Commons, Identity Commons, Open Sensing Framework, Open Off, Open ID, Open Identity Exchange, Identity Commons, the Locker Project. What they have in common is the use of technology to create some kind of data locker. This is ID Cubed's platform, a vault that's secured and protected by you and then would hold all of your personal information in one location. I focus on privacy and ownership as the focus of resistance to big data, but it's the larger context that I want to end on, the tension between big data and big democracy. I spoke earlier about content farms. They're part of a pattern in the US news industry, a shift in editorial power from push journalism, which publishes information that editors think people need to know in order to be well-informed, responsible citizens. Uh, a shift from push to poll journalism, which publishes what people want to know, stories with big demand, but not necessarily big civic content. A few weeks ago, this was the cover of Time Magazine's European edition. This was the cover of its Asian edition. This was the cover of its South Pacific edition. And this was the cover of the US edition. I have no doubt that in the US, there was greater demand for a story about animal friendship than for a story about the crisis in Europe. But the risk of a demand-driven, entertainment-driven society is that, as the title of Neil Postman's classic study put it, that we are amusing ourselves to death. In an age of show business, everything wants to be entertaining. In an age of information overload, every domain, not just media, competes to be noticed. <laughs> News, politics, commerce, religion, education, architecture, fashion, the arts, all culture is shaped to a surprising degree by the battle to capture our scarce attention. In this battle, there are Goliaths and there are Davids. Over the past year, around the world, nowhere has this been more apparent than in the public sphere. To occupy attention is to set the public agenda, which is to say attention is not only there to be monetized, attention is there to be mobilized. From the Arab Spring to Russia, from 15M to Occupy Wall Street, this mobilization of attention is resetting the public agenda. Plato would denounce this challenge to order. The poetry of the streets, he would say, is too dangerous a power. You may agree or disagree with the message of these movements, but there is no denying that the pictures they are making and the stories they are telling have captured the attention of the world. And speaking of attention, thank you very much for yours. Thank you very much, Marty, for this.